In this episode of the FCP Compliance Report, I have Professor George Seraphim, the recent author of the book Purpose Plus Profit, How Businesses Can Lift Up the World. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Welcome to another episode, and today I'm thrilled to have with me George Seraphim. George is a professor at Harvard, and he is the author of Purpose and Profit. He has written in a wide variety of spaces relevant to compliance and the compliance professional for many years, but we're here to talk about his book today. So, uh, George, first of all, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, welcome, and thank you so much for having oh, me. Thank you so much for having today. me. It's a great pleasure to have a conversation again with you. So could you tell us a little bit about sure. your academic background? Uh, I, I joined Harvard Business School almost about uh, uh, 12, 15 years ago now. And uh, I have been teaching there um, a course that was before that was called Reimagining Capitalism, uh, Business and Big Problems, discussing around issues of uh, anti-corruption and environmental degradation and social related issues around workplace practices and safety and so forth. And right now I'm doing quite a bit of work also around these ideas of purpose in the workplace and also around uh, how can we use new technologies, artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve outcomes, uh, organizational outcomes and outcomes for the people. Uh, have you started your fall uh, semester? I am starting right yet? now. Literally, we're gearing up and we're teaching. Uh, we're starting to teach uh, next week, actually, which is always, always very exciting. You feel the campus energy. You feel you feel students coming back onto campus, and it's just uh, incredible to see twenty something year old people, thousands of them, coming on campus, establishing new friendships, new relationships, and being on this growth trajectory, personal growth trajectory, where they're expanding their viewpoints and their skill sets. Uh, that, that really raises a great point uh, that I wanted to, to ask you about. This book, in many ways, seems to have been part of your personal journey, and you outlined that in the introduction a little bit. But I was wondering, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I came to to know about you from your work in anti-corruption compliance, and then you uh, wrote some additional papers around uh, white collar crime, but you, could you tell us a little bit about your journey uh, through those areas uh, and now to so, purpose? So, uh, Tom, I grew up in Athens, in Greece, uh, and that shaped a lot of my experience, my early experiences and the way that I'm thinking about many of those issues. So one of the things that I found in that experience was that there is a very strong link between transparency, accountability, and meritocracy. And why am I saying that? Because I feel that one of the most fundamental values in a society to produce good outcomes for the people is to have meritocracy inside the system. Meaning that Tom is better at doing a job than George is doing, Tom should be getting that job, right? Um, and I realized that in order to have this meritocracy, you need to have accountability. Meaning that, well, if Tom is producing better outcomes, then uh, Tom should be accountable for those outcomes and George should be accountable for the fact that he's producing worse outcomes in what he's doing. And then I discovered that a critical element of that is actually transparency. That without transparency, you cannot have accountability. And then without accountability, you cannot have meritocracy in society. So I became extremely interested then in increasing transparency uh, in, in our society around many of those issues. And I identified anti-corruption as a key element, I would say, of what has become now the broader ESG framework. Uh, because corruption is just... just deleterious, I would say, to the fabric, to the social fabric of society and then to the ideas of accountability and meritocracy. So I did quite a bit of work there trying to understand how we can increase transparency and how we can generate better outcomes. I did some work there on organizational practices, but also on larger initiatives such as the Extractive Transparency Initiative Act. 
And then I moved to the broader, one could say, environmental, social and governance domain. And I asked the question about how can we increase transparency and as a result, uh, create this uh, virtue cycle between transparency, accountability and meritocracy that eventually leads to better performance, right? Because once you have meritocracy in the system, then you actually have better people doing what they should be doing. And as a result, you're generating better outcomes for everyone. So that was a little bit my journey. And I, it was informed really my, by my early years growing up in Greece, uh, witnessing some of the absence of those uh, qualitative characteristics. And then moving up, uh, I lived for a few years in London and then I moved to Boston. Uh, I'm in, uh, I am what Americans refer to as a professor's kid. So I've been around universities all my life, been around uh, the academic life. And my father got his PhD in the sixties and I watched him, uh, in his journey in his field, uh, and the university he taught at gave him the flexibility and freedom to, to grow and, and take uh, different avenues of research into different areas. And it sounds like Harvard has allowed you to explore your passions and your interest and to grow in, in different directions. Although uh, I think you're absolutely right. The line from anti-corruption uh, compliance to ESG for me is pretty straightforward. Is that been you your know, experience Harvard has Harvard? changed my life, uh, Tom. I have to say I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to the institution. Uh, you probably can't find a, a, a bigger fan of Harvard than me. Uh, it has been transformational for me personally. I have witnessed uh, the university and Harvard Business School as a school as well, where I'm located at. Uh, being transformational for the lives of thousands of people. And I think something that Harvard has, uh, has done for me, and you mentioned that as well, it has given freedom. Freedom to pursue uh, intellectually different types of ideas, even though some of those ideas might not have been uh, widely accepted or mainstream at that point, and they might have seemed a little bit peripheral or niche. Um, so I think having an institution behind you, and I think that applies to um, a lot of people that are pursuing careers, uh, having the freedom to pursue ideas that seem differentiated and then really spend time and expand those ideas and grow those ideas has been something that has been afforded to me by Harvard. And the other key piece is interacting with incredible, incredible people uh, throughout my career at Harvard. It has been a, an enormous gift. I think uh, one of the things that I try to do always is to surround myself with people that are just better than me. Um, so I can grow myself by uh, bettering myself through the experiences of other people and collaborating with other people that are just incredible. Uh, let's turn to the book now, Profit uh, and Purpose, or Profit Plus Purpose. Why did you write this book? I wrote this book, this book uh, because of really many of my student experiences, right, that I have, I have seen over the years and uh, through my research and my teaching. And I, I say this story in the book where uh, when you ask people um, why other people go into business, everybody will say because they want to make money just because of money. But actually, when you ask people, why do you go into business? You get a very different answer. The reality is people would say, look, I have this interesting idea about this cool product that I think many people need and I'm really passionate about this product. Or they will say, look, I, I, I started working with three friends of mine and we created a company and it has been really awesome. I just, I just love working with these people. And other people will say, because I'm, I'm really passionate. I have created these 50 jobs and I, I really love the people that are working for my company uh, or the people that I'm working with and so forth. Or we created this kind of innovation and uh, the product is really changing the lives of people or it's making them just happier today, whatever that might be happening. And this idea that actually most people that go into business have actually a strong sense of purpose is something that I have seen in my own students over time that have end up doing incredible things, right? Um, so 
I, I took that idea and I described this idea in the book and then I say, well, hold on a second, if you actually take a step back and you look at many of those truly purpose-driven leaders, you observe many of the organizations that have created, and they are incredible organizations. They have end up being very profitable organizations and profit is really, really important, Tom, because without profit, something is not durable or scalable. Right? So you need actually profit and profit is a good thing because it allows for something to be uh, sustainable in, in, its, in its true form of, of, the, of the world, meaning that it lasts over time and then also it's scalable because you can do more of it. You can provide more of that product with more people. Um, so that motivated a lot and then I took a step back and I said, well, what is going on? Why is it that we're discussing more about the role of purpose in business? And I outlined that as, as the first part of the book. And I think a lot of what has changed in the operating context of business and in the operating context of all of us as business practitioners is technology has really changed the world. Technology has, uh, has done two things. The first one, it has uh, expanded transparency pretty significantly, right? We talked a little bit about transparency before, but it has made the world much more transparent. If you were going back 30 years ago and you were asking yourself, what is going on in the supply chain of, the, of this company? You'd say, I have no idea. And right now with an iPhone, you take a picture and then you put it on Twitter and 30,000 retweets later, everybody knows about something, right? So, um, the barriers to communication have come down through transparency and the other thing that has expanded is choice, right? So uh, thinking about, for example, choice in terms of products as a consumer that you might have or as an employee, in terms of your expansion of uh, employers across geographic segments. Of course, we see that now with remote uh, working and so forth, but choice has been expanded. So if you take those two ingredients that technology has created and you also couple this and you say, what has this created? Well, it has created a lot more voice, meaning that both customers and employees have a lot more voice about what they are expecting from organizations. And then you couple that with what drives competitiveness right now. And for most companies, we have evolved to an economy where most of the value of companies is dependent on human, social, intellectual capital, and the natural capital that they're having instead of just financial capital or physical capital. So from that perspective, you can see then that there is an interconnection between technology, the transparency and the choice that it has created, that is creating voice, and that effectively is leading to value. So from that perspective, any business manager should be able to understand how that operating context is changing and as a result, how one could create value in organizations. So that's, that's, that was the, the first bark and the origination of the book. The uh, legal or regulatory framework around this has also evolved. And I'm gonna, although it wasn't legal or regulatory, I wanna point to the Business Roundtable Statement on the Purpose of a Corporation, which expanded out uh, stakeholder, uh, starting with the definition of shareholders, expanded it out to stakeholders and said there are multiple constituents for every corporation. How do those sort of societal factors play into this uh, discussion as well? It's right? I think uh, one way of understanding the business roundtable statement is, uh, is really a symbolic statement, right, of the importance of what we're discussing before, the fact that uh, human, social, intellectual, and natural capital were, are becoming increasingly important drivers of competitiveness around the world. So I think, you know, this is reflected then in this statement by the Business Roundtable. And I think if you go around business leaders, you will find that most of them are saying, hey, you know, those factors are becoming more and more important. Um, always the, the, the devil is in the details, meaning that it's all about the balancing act uh, between how you view actually the, the ability to deliver short-term results, for example, that build credibility in, in the marketplace and also builds um, momentum inside the organization, but also keeping the eye on the long-term vision about how do you deliver for all stakeholders, right? And sometimes 
Tom, you see that people are, I would say, are polarized by thinking one or the other, while basically the, the leadership art is the balancing between the short-term performance and the long-term vision or the balancing act between how do you actually deliver for shareholders and customers and employees and so forth. And, you know, the reality of it is that lots of business leaders at many points in their career, they have to make tough choices, right? Um, so that's that's the, the, the critical element, I say, the, the glue of purpose-driven organizations, having the ability to make those tough choices, having the management systems, having the governance systems, having the culture to be able to make those tough choices. So I was born in the 1950s. That makes me a baby boomer. Uh, and we've had uh, at least two, perhaps, or three generational shifts uh, since the end of the boomers. How do you see the role of Gen Xers or, and or millennials playing out in this entire discussion about profit? You know, if you think purpose. about it, right? So um, like uh, Gen Z or Gen X or millennial or however you might, uh, you might call, I always get confused between those definitions, but they have grown up in a world that is very, very different actually, if you think about it, right? So they take uh, iPhone and uh, social media and apps uh, for granted. Right. So while uh, while people like yourself and myself, we, we just didn't grow up with that. Right. We're not taking for granted. So um, I think they, they view the world uh, a, a little bit different and they have very high expectations, I would say, about uh, workplace practices and about what they should uh, think of as um, standard basically, right, uh, in business and when they go in business. So they are looking for a lot more autonomy, um, a lot more opportunities for growth, um, and um, a lot more transparency, actually. Um, and a more direct, I would say, evidence that the work is somehow meaningful and is having impact. And I think that is a huge uh, movement. And when you're leading an organization, the question is, how do you attract uh, talent? How do you grow talent and how do you retain talent? And increasingly, the talent is coming from those generations. So understanding what are their expectations? And then again, it's a balancing act, right? So because, for example, lots of people might want to go towards extreme levels of autonomy, right? So but at the same time, you can say, well, hold on a second, right? So we still need to have some types of control systems and empowerment systems inside the organization, right? So some people might want never to come to the office, right? So um, how do you have the balancing act where some days you might be in the office, some days you are remote and um, you achieve what might be an optimal balance of things, um, especially when people might have very different expectations compared to what were the expectations previously and when you were running an organization. So I think understanding the needs and the expectations and also how you can have the balancing act with this new generation of employees is something extremely, extremely important. What is the role of data analytics or perhaps the question is, should be, how should a company think about data analytics in moving? Data industry? analytics, in my opinion, is like fundamental. Uh, really, really fundamental. And if you think about it, what they allow you to do is to gain insights at, uh, at a speed and at a scale that you would just wouldn't be able to do uh, before, right? So when you actually think about running a, a food company, right? And actually from a farming perspective and so forth, have technologies such as uh, satellite imaging, uh, that allows you to actually uh, gain insights that you would take forever to gain before, right? Um, same thing when you were thinking about um, even just basic technologies right now, such as censoring, right? And have a censoring, for example, when it comes to optimization of, re of routes of transportation and distribution to improve energy efficiency or whatever that might be. It's it's again fundamental. And when we're thinking then about the regulatory landscape, right? So um, I think data and analytics allows you to detect, for example, abnormalities in transactions that uh, maybe before it would have been 
maybe we would have detected, maybe we wouldn't have detected it. And now through AI and algorithm, it just becomes a much easier task. Not a perfect one by any chance, but a much easier one. So I think thinking about data analytics around generating insights is the right way of thinking about data analytics. I think many people get confused and they think about the data for the sake of data. Well, actually the value of the data is in the value of the insights and the actions that allow you uh, to generate. Uh, think, thinking about it as increasing both our speed, but also our ability to do things at a scale that we couldn't have done before is, is a very useful uh, way for finding use cases in your organization. In your book, you identify six archetypes of uh, value creation. I was wondering if you could uh, detail those for us and just kind of highlight what, uh, what yeah, your findings so we, were. So we asked area. the question, uh, that is in uh, chapter six of the book. And, you know, th there are so many different ways that um, through sustainability efforts and ESG efforts, one could create value inside the organization, but not all of them are easy. Right. So there are some low hanging fruits and there are some more complicated, transformative things that one could do in their side organization. So I created this uh, little framework where on the one axis you have the potential value creation that you could create um, through the actions. And on the other axis is the what I call the implementation risk. Basically, the risk that you might actually try to implement the strategy, but the strategy might fail. And not surprisingly, as one would you would expect, uh, the higher is the potential for value creation, the higher is also the implementation risk, meaning that it's actually pretty difficult to implement. So we start the scale from things that are, I would say, fairly uh, easy to do, um, although not trivial, but easier to do, such as, for example, uh, generating efficiencies inside the organization. Maybe you implement some actions and you decrease energy usage, you decrease the waste that you're generating, you decrease the water that you're using inside your process, your manufacturing process and so forth. Or you take some employee related issues and you actually increase employee productivity, you can create a safer, uh, a safer working environment, you avoid injuries and as a result you increase productivity inside the organization. And then as you go further up, you actually understand that what is required is more of a transformation of your operating model and your business model to realize those higher, uh, higher value creation. For example, you create completely do different business models that have a very different um, proposition, right? So a classic example of that might be um, electric vehicles relative to internal combustion engine vehicles. There is a huge transformation that's happening in the transportation sector that's creating enormous amount of opportunity for battery storage, right? So when we're thinking about that and as a result for battery manufacturing, right? So when you're actually starting to think about those transformations, of course, the potential for value creation is higher, but also the potential for implementation failure is higher. So I go through systematically some of those steps to paint that picture that uh, although on paper some things might look good, the reality of implementation on the ground sometimes it's much more complicated and involves both cultural transformation but also a transformation and change in practices when it comes to incentives, to the types of people that you're hiring and uh, to the governance structure inside the organization. Yeah, that's a great uh, segue into the next area I wanted to explore with you because it was a great story and it was a company called Southwire with 12 for Life. And I'm going to ask you a little bit about that, but what intrigued me equally was you had a student who tried to mimic that program in another company and was not successful. And uh, you pointed out uh, some of the reasons uh, it was not successful. But the message I got from that was something that the regulators in anti-corruption compliance hammer almost daily, which is every business is unique. And it doesn't matter what your formula is, you must adapt to the uniqueness of your own business. And I thought that was just a fabulous message. It was a 
tiny part of your book, but I found it to be as instructive as almost any other part. So that's my own personal bias, but uh, could you tell us a little bit about 12 for Life and then the lesson of uh, why uh, a student could not simply copy yeah, it and replicate it's a, it at another it's business? A, it's a message that resonates a lot with me as well, Tom, this idea that um, lots of businesses are unique and something that works in one company doesn't necessarily work in another company. So we have written, uh, there's a case, a Harvard Business School case that I have been teaching for many years around this uh, company Southwire. Uh, it's based in Carroll County in Georgia. The headquarters is a great company. Um, it's one of the biggest cable manufacturers in the world. And it has created for many years now a program where uh, because in Carroll County there is a very um, high uh, unemployment rate and also a high percentage of uh, kids uh, that are dropping out from high school. Kids are growing up in, in very, very difficult circumstances, personal circumstances, family circumstances. And the company, what it did is said as a major employer in the town, we have a role to play here to improve the outcomes for these kids. So they created this program, 12 for Life, that basically takes at-risk high school students, meaning the students that are at the highest risk of dropping out from high school, and put them in a program that is uh, partly about going back to schools and, provi and providing incentives for them to complete high school, and at the same time acquiring both soft skills, uh, social skills, but also technical skills in a manufacturing plant that has been custom made to accommodate from a, from a safety perspective and so forth, um, the, the kids that are in high school. And the outcomes from this program have been really actually in many ways incredible. Thousands of, of kids that have gone through the program and many of them have gone not only to complete high school, but actually going on to complete college. And from, from a company perspective, a lot of what you see as well is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm of employees to mentor the kids and really uh, develop strong relationships. So, so the community has, has benefited quite tremendously and, uh, and the company has really created a, a blueprint for community engagement really and creating tangible and measurable impact by leveraging your core capabilities, in this case being a manufacturer. Uh, the fascinating part is, I've been teaching this case for many, many years, and one of my extremely bright, bright students of mine said, you know, I, I try to do, as you said, the same thing. This, this example is part of the introduction of the book, and it, in a completely different state, county, and so forth, with a different company, he said it failed. It just, we just couldn't make it work. And uh, he wrote me this long email and he said, it's everything that we discussed in the class. It's about alignment of culture. Organizational culture makes a big difference. We just couldn't get the existing employees to provide the mentorship that, that the kids needed. It was also about alignment of incentives. Alignment of incentives with uh, the local educational institutions and the organization and how we could structure the class so that that didn't work as well. It was also a lack of trust. So one of the things that we were discussing in the case was how important trust was because trust facilitates the truthful communication of information and collaboration and that was an existing. So it was this idea that actually, you know, this is not easy. This is just not easy. And um, there are also many unique factors that are at play. So understanding the idiosyncratic circumstances of every business and then taking a step back and saying, how can I generate a better outcome is, is extremely important. The, uh, let me turn to perhaps down the road a little bit uh, and ask you uh, really, where you see all of this going. Uh, and I used to say 2025, but now I say 2030, and then I add the parenthetical as we start the mid-century. Uh, so as we move into mid-century in the 21st century, uh, where do you see uh, purpose in the context of corporate uh, strategies and it's even a, those on debt? It's a very interesting question, Tom. For me, uh, in to in a large in a larger way, right? In a more general way, um, 
I think one of the biggest uh, wasted resources inside the company is when employees wake up in the morning and they don't really want to go to work. They just are not engaged. So they come to the workplace or now even logging in on their laptop from, from home, uh, from a remote perspective, and they give their 20%. Um, and it's hard every day to give your 100%, but um, I think there is a real opportunity for people to feel that their work is meaningful, that they believe in the vision of the organization, and they have the clarity that they have agency to affect that vision inside the organization. Clarity is a very, very important element that we have found in our research as well. So um, I think if you build organizations where people feel strongly about the work that they are doing and they are able to collaborate, um, not, uh, not only like not only just be nice to themselves because sometimes like purpose also is misunderstood as just we're just nice people and we're interacting in nice ways of course that is a good thing but it's a lot also about challenging each other growing each other giving candid feedback and really believing in the in the purpose that we're trying to achieve within the organization i think it's actually a game changer why is the game changer because of what we discussed before because increasingly the value of most companies really depends on the collective intellectual capital that's been created by employees inside the organization. So when you can actually drive productivity and innovation by having, uh, by being able to attract uh, better talent, by being able to retain that talent and grow that talent inside the organization, I think it can be a huge, uh, a huge competitive advantage that is also sustainable over time. Um, so that element, my sense is that it's going to become more and more important. Why is it going to become also more important? Because I think the world is becoming more complicated. The world is becoming more complex. And as a result, having the ability to generate value within teams that are bringing an interdisciplinary perspective is also very, very important. So that's, that is another element that I think the economy is becoming more complex, the world is becoming more complex, and the ability for people to collaborate and cooperate is becoming more important inside the organization. So having a common set of purpose that is clear to people and provides that alignment and that platform for collaboration is, is increasingly important, as you say, as you're, we're moving towards the mid of the century, although that, that still feels long, long times away. Uh, that it does. George, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on the topics you've touched on, and most importantly, where can they go to get the book? For the book, any, any retailer that you can find from uh, Amazon to Barnes and Nobles and so forth. We also have uh, a web page out there that is purpose, uh, purposeandprofitbook.com, uh, and you can find all the possible ways that one could get uh, the book. And in general, kind of uh, or for anybody that is interested in more uh, quantitative and mathematics and so forth, always on my Harvard webpage, we post free access on all the research that we're doing. This has been just a, a delightful and fascinating conversation. I hope Thank we you can so much, Tom, this for discussion. Me. This is Tom Fox again. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you would leave a review in our comment section, I would greatly appreciate it. I look forward to visiting with you again on the next episode of the FCPA Compliance Report.